Um, I think it's probably best to just give you a bit of background. Um, my passion and, and interest for a lot of years have been um, on the natural heritage side. So very much connecting communities to nature. But, but really starting where local people are in terms of their interests and passions. So we started the project, well, the project that I work on in Rocky Ferry in Dundee, um, which is obviously quite an affluent area. And we've worked on a lot of projects linked to the natural environment, creating sand martin nesting banks, doing environmental education, interpretation, and things like that. And increasingly, um, as funding got a bit tighter, we were being pushed to work into other areas of Dundee. And this um, burn, the dictate, kind of started to be spoken about. I'm a listener. I go out and I listen to what people talk about, and then try and find out what their passions are and spin projects off the back of that. So this is a small burn, the Dickety, um, in, in eastern Dundee. And hopefully you can see from the, that map that it kind of puts a protective arm around Dundee. It runs from the Tear Estuary at Monifleeth and then skirts um, much of Dundee to finish up in Lundy, just at the base of the, the Sidlaw Hills. So it's a very kind of intimate burn, and I think that's what we're kind of capitalising upon in this project. So I've been focusing on this particular area, mainly working from um, the kind of central bit, really, that sits at the back of Dundee, which is surrounded by housing estates um, at the moment, running through the communities of Douglas, Spintry, Hatton, <coughs> Whitfield, Kirkton, Miller Mains, McCravey. If any of you know Dundee, you will have had a connection with, with the burn. So um, our project really has been, again, focusing on the green space along this, <coughs> along this burn. Some of it doesn't look that great, and the quality of the water over the years has has not been has not been great. Um, a, a dumping place, you can see development is very, very close to the banks of the burn. But um, you can probably recognise being archaeologists, and because that isn't my discipline, I don't really see the landscape in that way. You can see bits of wall there which were associated with um, mills and leech works that used to be that used to be up to 60 along the banks of this very small burn. So as we started to develop this project, and I'll talk a bit about the the way in which it started and then link on to the archaeology elements as it goes on. So these are some of the, the, the aspects that we're looking at. Quite a bit of green space. But in all of this burn is within a stone's throw of people's houses. So in the past, if all the children, everybody had a connection to this burn. They either fell in it, got pushed in it, stopped by it, chucked their beer in it. Some of them, unfortunately, died in it. <clears throat> but it's got a really human scale. Everybody can connect to this bird a lot more than they can to, to the Tay. So I'm kind of thinking, reflecting on the, the opening speaker's remarks, that actually, I think, communities and community interests can actually start to break down barriers between communities across a wide variety of disciplines. Because all of our projects start from the passions and interests of local people. And we're focusing on about five miles of burn, all within a stone's throw of, um, of housing. And it actually does link different communities. <coughs> So this gives you a, an impression of kind of what it's like. And as I said, there were a lot of mills 
up to 60 mills and bleach works along this area. And then in the 20th century, almost everything just got, got destroyed, um, except for small remnants like this. Um, one of the also interesting things linked to the burn from an environmental point of view is that it's becoming one of the, the area is monitored now by SEPA, the Scottish Environmental um, Protection Agency, and one of the reasons why the burn can't reach their excellent quality standards is because it has been carpeted and its, it's roots changed in a lot of different areas. So because it hasn't got its meandering course, we can't, uh, it's not going to have a high designation from Seeker's point of view. But what we've tried to do, one of the, the local history elements, is we've picked up and we've done micro-hydro surveys and assessments of the burn, because obviously it was a powerhouse for Dundee. You know, it wasn't the tay that drove the, 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 the mills and the turbines, it's, it's this bit of water. So um, we've looked at micro-hydro potential for actually powering some of the communities, and that's another project that we're going to work on. <coughs> so, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail. So what we do with all of our projects, and they're really, really diverse, is we start from local people's interests and passions, and skills, and knowledge, and energy, and we set up human scale projects to capitalise upon that. A lot of our projects have been linked to conservation, so we've been involved a lot in planting wild plant meadows, doing um, tree planting, um, creating ponds, establishing areas for wildlife, and also off the back of that, we have been involved in a lot of what the environmental side call citizen science. So a lot of biological recording, whether it be um, particular wildflower species for habitat management, whether it be bird species, red squirrels, particular um, water qualities and things like this. I think there is, there has always been a, an acceptance that actually local people can feed in a lot of good quality biological information to actually show um, uh, different biology, biologists and the kind of the workers who are working on these bigger projects that can provide this baseline information. So there's been an acknowledgement in the natural uh, heritage sector that local people's knowledge is valued. So we've pushed ahead a lot with projects uh, from, from that point of view. Um, we've also been involved, as you can see from that um, poster, a lot in the arts, um, because we find that the arts really bring people in. They make the, the natural heritage accessible um, and, and develop interest. So we've decorated all the 14 Foot bridges across the burn with various groups. We've done um, photography projects and produced amazing calendars like, like this. Um, and we've even done a lot of writing projects, put, pulling together books focused on um, people's in, inspired writing about the burn. Um, uh, you're probably not very knowledgeable on um, the likes of writing of June Cromley, who writes very extensively for the Courier, but he's a natural um, history writer and he's contributed this book to this book because he comes from Dundee. So we've covered a wide variety of areas <coughs> and also our ways of disseminating information are, are kind of varied as well. We've put a very nice poster together like this. We've also worked quite heavily with people making films. Um, they produced a, um, a DVD called God Made the Liquidy. Now, it's not full of nice little images of uh, wildflowers and swans and herons and kingfishers that inhabit the burn, but it's about the cannabis growing that has gone on along very fast, <laughs> or the fact that very often people go along and kill deer and string them up. And also, um, there's um, 
a local um, musician has written various songs and pieces about the bird. So it looks at that, it, it, we all tend to see things through our eyes and not through other people's eyes. And that's what the breadth of this project does. It doesn't narrow people down, it encourages everybody to look at things from other people's eyes and other people's viewpoints. And therefore, we see something different. And I think this is the power. Just because I was talking to people a lot about this project, and the projects and things that we've had going on, lots of folk have a story. And they also recognize that there's a lot of historical elements to this poem. Well, not being a historian, and not having any archaeological experience and really getting confused with dates that go in the past. I started scrubbling around to try and find, and this seems to be my skill, try and find experts or helpers who can work alongside local communities to recognise their skills, pick up on their passions and provide more information. Well, I had to scrabble around for a long time. Dundee City Council just it doesn't seem to have a feature on their radar. The only thing that came out of the back of a conversation with, with um, a woman in Dundee City Council was, why don't you rebuild um, a coracle? So I didn't think there was an image in there, but we did that. We managed to find somebody to uh, rebuild the coracle, and we took children sailing down the <laughs> Some of them fell out. So that was my kind of foray into the, into the historical side. And then, it was really unfortunate, we try, I tried to get into Scotland's rural past, by trying to convince them that we were on the edge of Dundee and it was a bit raw. <laughs> anyway, it didn't happen. Um, but fortunately, and I'm never quite sure how these things happen, I think as if by magic or some sort of energy, uh, Cara kind of appeared from archaeology <laughs> Scotland. And I thought, this is a woman who, like myself, can start from where local people are, listen to their stories, and develop projects that are meaningful for them. So, we started. And we started just very tentatively to start spinning some ideas. And we're probably still at that taster sort of stage, you might say. Um, but what we, what we did is we started, we publicised uh, a walk along the burn. And we got some people who were, uh, most of the folk who never had a connection with, with kind of history in a formal sense. But we ended up with a really good mix of folk. Um, probably about 15 or 20 adults. And then um, we got a group of children who come from a local secondary school. One of the teachers had heard about it from Greyview Academy. And they got a group that they were working with who were struggling with English. And they wanted to get them involved in projects that would hopefully engage them and raise their communication skills, get them out into speaking to other people and things like that. So we kind of thought the folk who are maybe quite passionate about being doing surveying and these younger kids, well they're not kids, young people, were probably not going to mix particularly well. So, give Cara a credit, she came up with several ideas to engage the group from Greyview Academy. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately it was very cold when we went out and started doing this, but what we did is we surveyed a lot of the graffiti. We had to start from where people were. They knew about all the tags and things like this. So we surveyed the graffiti on some of the heritage features along the burn as a way to actually start engaging with this group. We also, um, thanks to Archaeology Scotland's resources, got them handling various artifacts. 
and I'm promising that I learned a lot about um, history and archaeology from these sessions. We also encourage the children to start telling stories about, uh, about their engagement with the burn and how they could get involved in, in, in taking care of it. We got excellent feedback from this, um, from this um, particular class and the teachers were gobsmacked at the engagement of the group. It's normally the, the kids that maybe are a bit on the, the edge of being excluded that tend to get the opportunities to work in more creative ways. Well, these kids really responded, these young people really responded. They were really interested in the project, interested in all the survey work, especially interested in the handling. And the feedback that we got from the, from the teachers was, was fantastic. In fact, it was, yeah, it was, it was overwhelming, but their communication was considerably better. Their sense of community and citizenship was good. It was also testing their analytical skills and that kind of independent thinking. So we're hoping that this, this connection will go on. The other, the other element that we've got here, we always try and integrate various projects into, um, into the burn. We've done various mosaic features and things like this. The other element was to try and survey up all the outstanding features along the burn. Um, Cara said that there was nothing on the historic monuments website given and given the amount of activity, industrial heritage in that area, there should be bits and pieces. So um, David, who's here with me today, did a sterling job, in fact a very sterling job, in um, documenting all the outstanding features that were along, that were, um, along the burn. And we're hoping to work with Cara in the future to take that um, project forward. Um, Another project that, I, that was highlighted is we found this old milestone, um, which it now is in the centre of Dundee, but then I think it says about three or four miles. So what we're doing with that project is um, now working with a local mosaic group to create another six way markers that go along the burn. This is, this is one of the way markers and it incorporates words from Jim Crumlin. Another of our projects, and that's a very poor photograph, is these are some characters created by uh, a local person called the Dixie Dwellers. We run environmental education sessions and kind of forest school activity sessions linked to these puppets and a dragon that features quite heavily. So we try and use innovative ways of, connect, of connecting people to the local environment and the history. This is another leaflet that was put together by a local gas fitter, um, he knew nothing about geology, he does now, called Dealing on a Lava Flow. He's now going to take that into schools and uh, enable local school children to learn more about the burn and the geology of the area. As I said, we do a lot of biological recordings, so we've got that recording sort of ethos. This is them um, testing the area for, for flooding potential. Um, this is the group um, digging a pond. That's David doing some metal detecting, which he has done in every area that we've created for uh, developing ponds or scrapes for wildlife. Um, he's very closely linked to all the treasure trove staff, and um, so I, I, I mean, I'm not aware of the handouts, but um, apparently there's some linked to um, metal detectorists. But actually, it's, it's really engaged a lot more people in the, the conservation side and started us off in terms of the finding out the history about the area through, through David and a lot of his mates as well. Um, but as I said, it's all, you know, above board. So I think it's just about that engagement. So, yeah, we, we disseminate and engage in a whole variety of very dis, dis, distinctive and disper, dispersed ways. One of our projects that we're pushing at the moment, seeing as food seems to be quite high on the agenda, is doing loads of wild food workshops and cooking sessions. Uh, and finally, 
Germany. Uh, I don't know if you know Dundee, but there was a race course in Dundee in the 1920s. Little did anybody know. So only there for two years. And we had a local history group working on this. They put together a booklet, and off the back of it, in April of next year, which is the 90th anniversary of this race course coming and going, um, we're going to have a, a recreation of that, that race course event, of that race meeting. So we're asking people to write monologues of people who would have been at the events. They might have been the bookie, they might have been the jockey, or they might have been the drunk or the pickpocket. So we hope that on the 12th of April next year we'll have a really amazing performance. But this has picked up from been picked up from the local history linked to the site. So thank you very much for sticking with me on this scene as it's not my area. I hope it's given you food for thought.